We are in the midst of a series talking about the book of Revelation. Remember, it is the only book that has a promise attached to it just for reading it. Blessed is the one who reads it and the one who hears it. So we're going to, we've already read some of it today together. Uh, we're certainly going to hear about it. But it's important, in fact, vital that we know about the times that are about to unfold the end times in which we're in. As I've begun this series and begun to look at things, one of the things I've, I've noticed as Holy Spirit is moving is that He's directing me to a message that is where He is in the midst of what's going on. I anticipated as I began this series that I would be digging into the details of what happens this year, what happens this month, what's going on here. Let's get all the fine details of it. And that's not the way Holy Spirit's led me. Every time I go down that road and I start the outline of what is there, and then suddenly he says, now here's what I want to tell the people. See, the facts of what's going to happen are simply facts. You need to be aware of them. That's why it's not wise to argue with people about prophetic events. You know, is the Antichrist going to come from the Middle East? Is the Antichrist going to come out of the revived Roman Empire? You know, I mean, you can have all those discussions you want. All we know is there is going to be an Antichrist. Okay? We know what he's going to be like. We know some of the things he's going to, to do. But the more important question is, were you to be alive in the, in the time of the Antichrist, where is your God? And who are you? And how do you live through these things? Too many people, I find, are running around becoming specialists, so to speak, in end times events, but the very presence of God or the success in their life is failing. They can't live through the times that are now with joy, happiness, and peace, and shalom, and yet they're going to become experts in the end time. doesn't do any good if you know all the events and how they line up, but you can't have victory just going through the supermarket. <laughs> There's no point in, in knowing what's going to happen in the unfolding things if bad news that is simply slight bad news today wipes you off, doesn't make any difference that you can talk to your, your neighbor or your coworker with all the authority of the Word of God about what's going to happen when the plagues come and all that. The question is, who are you when plagues come? Because if you do not have a God who can get you through them, through the... Through the uh, fire without the smell of smoke, through the floods, and they don't overcome you. What is the advantage of knowing these end things? So when we come into Revelation chapter 6, 7, and 8, and on, we come into these seven seals that we began to talk about last week. Who is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals? And so we find that in this section of the book of Revelation, there are seven seals. Revelation 6, 1 through 17, chapter 8, 1 through 5. That is, then we see that there are seven trumpets. That's in Revelation 8, 6 through 13, Revelation 11, 15 to 19. And then finally we read about seven bowls. That's in Revelation 16, 1 through 21. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Seven being the number of completion, the fullness of everything that's going to take place. You're going to get all of it, be it judgment or reward. Amen? I want all of reward. <laughs> but God who gives all of reward is also a God who's going to bring complete judgment when that time comes upon us. And what we need to understand is that each series introduces the next. In other words, the seven seals introduce the seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets introduce the seven bowls. Have you ever been to a 4th of July uh, firework display and seen one of those fireworks go up, 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 and then it explodes into a starburst? And that's so wonderful. But as the pieces come down, suddenly they burst out into further starbursts, and then maybe even a third so it goes up, and they burst out, but in, in those parts it burst out is another burst of, of uh, fireworks, and then another one after that. That's kind of like how this goes. The seven trumpets are contained in the seventh seal. So you've got seven seals, but when you come to the seventh seal, that releases seven trumpets. And when you come to the seventh trumpet, 
that releases the seven bowls. It is a cascading event that is taking place. If we look at the seven seals first, by the way, the first four of them are represented by horsemen going forth. You may have heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's referring to those first four of the seven seals. The first seal introduces the Antichrist. That's in Revelation 6, 1 through 2. By the way, you can just kind of follow along. I got all the notes downstairs if you're not getting each one of these. The second seal causes great warfare, Revelation 6, 3 to 4. The third seal causes famine, Revelation 6, 5 through 6. If you don't know how quickly famine can come on a land, you need to go on YouTube and look at some of the History Channel videos of the, of the Great Dust Bowl Depression. Things that you can't imagine. I saw last week a picture, photographs that were taken of a man standing on a building in the Midwest. And off in the distance there was this humongous black, black cloud making its way toward the city. It was a dust storm. And as it got closer, it got darker and darker and you could not see the sun. And it swept through that city. And when it had gone by the city, it left three feet of dirt. Think of that. Three feet of snow would be bad enough. Three feet of dirt throughout the entire city. Our entire Midwest was just devastated in that. Famine can come quickly. That's the third seal. The fourth seal brings about plague, more famine, and further warfare. The fifth seal tells us of those who will be martyred for their faith in Christ during the end times period. And the sixth seal brings a devastating earthquake causing massive upheaval and terrible destruction along with unusual uh, phenomena in the sky. The earthquakes at the end of times are going to be unlike anything planet earth has ever, ever, ever experienced. Now in Revelation 8, turn with me there for a minute, Revelation chapter 8. When we get to Revelation chapter 8, we're coming to the time of the opening of the seventh seal. Now, now remember what I said, the seventh seal is going to release the seven trumpets. When you come to the seventh trumpet, that's going to release the seven bowls. So we have been through six Seals being released. Judgment on planet earth because of the wickedness of mankind. It is cause and consequence. The consequence of all the wickedness of mankind is re released in those six seals. The Antichrist, the great warfare, the great famine, plagues, more famines, a people being martyred, devastating earthquakes. In a short period of time, these things are going to like be released in planet earth in ways that cause the hearts of men to fail. They can't imagine how things like that can just so quickly, like a tsunami, take over the entire planet. But when we come to Revelation chapter 8, listen, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Think about that. When you read through all the other seals, there's clapping thunder, there's lightning flashing, there's roars taking place. Everything that is dispatched has sound attached to it, and the sound fills the earth and fills the heavens. But when we come to the opening of the seventh seal, when it's open, there's silence in heaven, and John tells us for about a half an hour. Isn't that interesting that he even puts a time frame in it that there's silence in heaven. The 24 elders have ceased their harp playing. The angels have hushed their voice. The cherubim and seraphim and all the hosts of heaven have fallen into absolute silence. So great is the silence that all of heaven is in awe of it. Silence is not a pleasant thing. I know when I Oh, it's doing radio broadcasts. You don't want silence. 
You don't want 30 seconds, 20, you don't even want 15 seconds of silence because in that 50, 15 seconds, somebody's going to change to another channel. They're going to go to another station. Silence is an unpardonable thing to have when you're broadcasting over the airwaves. And yet, here we find that silence is going to take over heaven. Heaven is not a silent place. The angels are around 24-7, if there's such a time measurement even there. Praising God, worshiping God, the elders are worshiping God. Heaven is filled as it has been through all eternity with great praise and great noise. And suddenly the seventh seal is open in total silence. Can you imagine if we got a group of us in here and we're going to, to act out and go through the, the seven seals and we have drums and we have cymbals and a seal gets released and someone bangs the cymbals and somebody's banging on the drums and we got electric guitars and we got all kinds of noise going and then we stand up and someone reads and the seventh seal is open and everybody making the noise instantly stops. The fans are turned off. You can't hear a sound and nobody moves and it's silent for half an hour. How many people would leave? After five minutes or ten minutes or f how many would sit there in that silence? Would somebody feel like, like they have to say something? Silence that is impacting. Silence that is awkward. Silence that you can feel like the silence perhaps of a husband and wife who have quarreled deeply and they're at a restaurant and there's not a word going between them as they sit and eat their meals. A silence you can feel. A silence that is palpable. A silence that is heavy. The seventh seal is opened and John says, and there was silence in heaven. You've got to know heaven, what it's like to understand that silence is absolutely unheard of in heaven. The angels have fallen into silence after six seals have opened. And when the seventh seal, which contains the seven trumpets, when that is open. Absolute silence. The 24 elders, their hearts are stilled. The angel choir is praising that seal's open and they fall into silence. And as I was reading that with Holy Spirit, I began to ask the question, what is that silence about? What is that silence about? I began to meditate on that. I found out not too many people talk about it. They read, it, read right over it. But I think it's a silence because after six judgment have been released on planet earth, there's silence to see if man is going to respond. The silence isn't on earth. The silence is in the heavens. It can be the silence that you can imagine when those miners were trapped down in South America for, I don't know, 60 days or what it was in the mine underground. And they're sending, you know, these sound tubes down. They're trying to find out if they're alive and everything like that. And, you know, and they're probing. And all of a sudden in this field, bang, bang, bang of these hammers driving things down. And guys listening. And all of a sudden somebody goes, silence. And the hammers stop. And nobody moves. And everybody looks at the one person who's listening through his phones to find out, can he even hear a whisper of life from down there? Absolute silence is filled with, with the tension of, is it going to end in good news or is it going to end in bad news? Is there going to be silence and they hear a voice and he says, I hear a voice and everybody cries out. Or is it going to be totally silent and he says, I hear Nothing. And hope fades and fails. Six judgments have been released on planet earth. The earth has been devastated by the wrath of God. The consequences of sin have affected the very ecosystem of this planet. God doesn't have to do things. He releases simply his hold that is keeping this planet from disintegrating already. 
We bombarded the planet with sounds of pornography and profanity from satellites surrounding, and we know what sound does to substance. The very substance of the planet, as the scriptures say, is groaning under the weight of sin. The planet is beginning to come apart because of men's sin and profanity. And judgment comes after judgment comes after judgment comes. And there will be those during that time who, who cry out to those around them, Repent! Repent! And when the seventh seal is open, instantly, silence from heaven to listen for even the faintest cry from humanity saying, God, we repent. God, we repent. You know it says it was silent for half an hour. That could be a literal half an hour. I personally think it was a prophetic half an hour. Prophetically, a day equals a year. And so a half an hour equals one week. You don't have to believe it. It can be a literal half hour. It can be a prophetic half hour. Either way, it's a short period of time. But if it is a week, can you imagine? For one week in earth time, silence in heaven as every angel, every cherubim, every seraphim, listening for the sound of anybody who will repent. Lest that seventh seal release those seven trumpet judgments and earth be devastated beyond all measure. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. How many times has there been silence in heaven waiting to hear from you? Silence in heaven as they're waiting for your word. What will your word be? What will you say? God delivers a message smack dab right in your face. And then there's silence as God waits to hear. What are you going to say? You read a book and right there in the book is your life written out there as if somebody knew all the issues you were wrestling with. And before you turn the page, Holy Spirit is saying, that's you. You need to change. And then there's silence. As God waits for what will you say? What will you say? You're right, God, I need to deal with that later. You're, you're right, God, someday I'm going to get that straight. You're, you're right, God, silence waiting before the next chapter of your life gets opened. And then the seven trumpets are released. The fact that the seven trumpets are released, if I'm right about that silence, means that no response came back saying that humanity had a massive revival and repented. The seven trumpets are the contents of the seventh seal. The first trumpet causes hail and fire that destroys much of plant life on the earth. The second trumpet, the first trumpet, the second trumpet brings about what seems to be a meteor hitting the ocean. It says a great mountain flaming came out of the sky and hit the ocean and caused the death of much of the world's sea life. What else do you think a meteor that size is going to cause? A massive tsunami. People know that. They've even made movies about it. The third trumpet, similar to the second, except its effects the world's lakes and rivers instead of the oceans. The fourth trumpet causes the sun and moon to be darkened. The fifth trumpet results in a plague of demonic locusts that attack and torture humanity. The sixth trumpet releases a demonic army that kills a third of humanity. One third of humanity. One third of humanity. We don't even know how to deal with things like that. 
One third of humanity were that to affect our nation right now means there will be no hospitals to go to. There probably will be no police or fire to take care of emergency needs. There will be no government that is going to come to your aid. One third of humanity. Inconceivable to our minds. One third of humanity. And then we come to that seventh trumpet. And remember what I said. Each seventh one releases the next round. The seventh trumpet calls forth the seven angels who have the seven bowls of God's wrath. And so we come to the seven bowl judgments. The first bowl is painful sores that break out on humanity. The second bowl results in the death of every living thing in the sea. Every living thing in the sea. The third bowl causes the rivers to turn into blood. The fourth bowl results in the sun's heating being intensified and causing great pain. The fifth bowl causes great darkness and an intensification of the sores of the first bowl. The sixth bowl results in the Euphrates River being dried up and the armies of the Antichrist being gathered together to wage the battle of Armageddon. And the seventh bowl results in the final devastating earthquake followed by hailstones. Revelation chapter 16, there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. Every island fled away. That means all the islands disappear in the upheaval of that earthquake, and the mountains could not be found. Think of that. A seismic event on planet Earth that causes every nation. Hawaii is no more. Guam is no more. Japan is an island. Japan is no more. All the islands disappear under the sea. And the mountains themselves are leveled. Mountains. The rocky mountains collapse. The human mind can't even wrap itself around such a what earth-shaking event that literally levels the cities of the nations. Frankfurt, Germany is flat. Paris, France is flat. London, England is flat. Washington, D.C. looks like that little section of New York that was devastated by the fire in the recent a hurricane that went through absolutely flat, nothing left standing. We've seen earthquakes that have leveled things, but the cities of the nations are leveled flat. And as I said earlier, I believe all of that is triggered by the very sounds man in their rebellion against God have made the earth, can contain it no longer in the entire earth shakes. But there's an amazing event that happens through all of that. An amazing thing in the midst of it. I don't believe you and I are going to be here for this, by the way. I do believe that the Bible's clear about the rapture. But there will be believers on this planet. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. And there's an amazing story in the midst of all that's taking place. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or the tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. Say the seal of the living God. What is the seal? If you think back into the days of, of kings and emperors when they would have a document they would roll up the document, they're going to send it to somebody, and they would take a signet ring or a seal separate from a ring. They would put wax on the document, and they would put their seal in it. Now, that document is closed. 
when I deliver it to you and you receive it, if the seal has been tampered with, you know somebody, because nobody else can fake his seal. Nobody can, can counterfeit his seal. It's the king's seal, and it arrives to you. You have full confidence that document was marked by the king. I saw the, east, uh, the angel coming from the east having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. What an amazing thing. In the midst of destruction, in the midst of a devastation about to be released on the planet, there is an angel assigned to seal or mark on the forehead those who are his. Where do you think the Antichrist got the idea of the mark of the beast? He doesn't come up with original ideas. He counterfeits what he knows God does. Glory to God. Listen to this. Then he goes through and he numbers the 12,000 from all the tribes and there's 140 4,000 of them. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. Now down in verse 9 it says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude no one could count. Now wait a minute. Just six verses earlier, he's, he's, he's talking about a seal is going to be put. He's talking about 144,000 of them. But after he numbers 144,000, he says, Now I look, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Jump down to verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are those who have come out of, come out of the great tribulation. In other words, there were believers who were taken away before the tribulation happened. But now there's this multitude who have come out of the tribulation. They've been delivered out of the tribulation. My question is, how did they come out? The sealed ones were preaching the word of God to them. Interesting that the Bible identifies those 144,000 as men of Jewish descent, unmarried men, totally committed to Yeshua as Messiah, who are from all over the world. And they are therefore in the world speaking in the languages of the people the good news about Mashi the Mashiach. I said, stop and think about it. This, this is not English-speaking missionaries going into the world. There's not enough time for that. You come up and say, Pastor, I want to be a missionary to India like Randy and Heidi. I want to be a missionary to to Africa. By the way, remind me, I'll show you a, a neat clip of some orphanages work that's being done in Africa. But see, we take you and we say, okay, you got to go to school. You got to go to Bible school. You want to be a missionary? We send you to Bible school. Then we send you a training program. And then finally, we send you over to, to a foreign nation. And it takes anywhere between three to five years to get you verbal enough in that language so you can preach the gospel. We don't have three to five years. This whole event is only seven years in the tribulation. No, these are saved, born again, sealed Jewish men in every nation. Remember, where are they? They're scattered into the nations. They might not even know they're Jewish or what tribe they're from. They're going to find out. And God is using His people, Israel, to preach this last great revival. He's not using the church. Why? The church isn't here. The church has been removed and now the message of salvation is coming through 144,000 Jewish evangelists and John says they win so many to Yeshua 
that when they show up and have it dressed in their white robes, there are too many to count. Too many to count. Those Jewish evangelists are going to bring more in than Reinhard Bonnke ever thought of. And he's over the millions already. Glory to God. He seals them for their ministry in the midst of the tribulation. Now, hold that thought. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and put your seatbelts on. You see, the, the book of Revelation is about devastating times. Times of judgment. Times that, that we can't even fathom. You know, here in America at this time, we're, we're looking at 2013 to find out what's going to be happening economically. And if, if, you, uh, if you look at the people who should know, it's not going to be a pleasant scene. When I say should know, I'm not saying the government officials. I'm not saying the politicians. And I'm not saying your leading newspapers. But there are a group of people who accurately, accurately, uncannily predicted the total failure of the housing market. And everybody laughed at it. Headlines were the burst of the housing bubble isn't going to happen. Big headlines just putting down these guys who, who predicted within months when the housing bubble was going to burst. They predicted. Those things don't happen in economics. These guys did it. And immediately afterwards, they wrote a book <laughs> which became a bestseller because now everybody wants to know, well, what else do you know? But nobody's wanting to believe what they know now because what they're writing now is 2013, the entire economic system is going to collapse. It cannot be sustained. You cannot sustain a housing market when people are buying houses they can't afford. It is going to fail. That's all they were saying. Simple economics. Housing in about a five-year period was shooting up 10, 20% a year. Well beyond people's ability. So banks started giving money to people who couldn't pay it back. Dur, dumb, it's going to fail. The government is now printing money it can't pay back. It just prints it. Where does it get it? You have to go get another job to get more. The government just cranks the press and gives you paper. And that whole system is now trillions in debt. So it's going to collapse. But that's nothing compared to what the end times are. But I'll tell you, if God can do something for believers in the end times, <laughs> God can do something for you and I right in the middle of whatever happens here. Boy, if he can't do it in, in a puny thing like an economic collapse, what is he going to do when the mountains collapse? See, if God can't, can't, can't protect his own and deal with his own and provide for his own, when the, the money system collapses, what is he going to do when the, when the very ecology collapses, when the world itself collapses. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 He anointed us set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is going to come. Look what God did. He put his seal of ownership. Paul's addressing Christians, believers, those who've come to receive Yeshua as the Messiah. And of all places, he's addressing the Corinthian church, which is filled with problems. But nevertheless, he says about them, that when you came and surrendered your life to Christ, when you sent, surrendered your life to the plan of God, God put his seal of ownership on on you. He came along and stamped you right in the middle of your forehead. I thought of getting a rubber stamp and going through the congregation and just poking you like that. He put a seal of ownership. Say that with me. Seal of ownership. Now if you've got a seal of ownership on you, who owns you? The one who put the seal there. God. Your God's Property. You ever see things? Property of the U.S. government. A fine if you misuse it. Property of the U.S. Army. You'll go to jail if you steal it. Property of somebody else. 
God's got a sign, a seal on you that you are His property. Who needs to know that? You do. Because the devil does know it. But he's hoping you don't know it. All right? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going somewhere with this. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him. Same concept as sealed in Him. You were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Just what He told the Corinthians. You've got a seal on you. And the seal on you is Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the seal of the believer. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand why so many, why the devil hates the Holy Spirit? You were marked with a seal. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 30. Ephesians 4.30, Paul writes this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, we all know from popular uh, you know, books and movies around about the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast gets put on you whether it's on your forehead or on your hand and you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. I got to tell you there's another mark. It's the mark of the lamb and you can't get into heaven without the mark of the lamb. There's no way you're going to get into heaven without the mark of the lamb. Without that seal on you. Oh yeah, you can't buy or, or sell maybe in this planet earth because you don't have whatever it is, some microchip or something that's been implanted in you, some mark of the beast. But you can't get into heaven unless you've been marked by the seal of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed for that day. We're going somewhere. And you got a ticket. We're going somewhere and you and I are meant to have supreme confidence. We don't hope about where we're going when we die. <laughs> we're not waiting to see. We're not approaching heaven with fear and trembling that somehow or other, you know, they're going to weigh in a balance and, 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 and our deeds don't weigh out. There will be in a way of weighing of deeds, but not whether you get in or not. You only get in if you have the seal. You only get in if you're marked by the Lamb. And Paul says about the believer, you and I were sealed. We were marked. We were stamped, says one of the translators. We were stamped with the Holy Spirit saying, I am His and He is mine. Amen. Oh, come on. That ought to give you some confidence. That ought to give you some confidence. You know, when you know you belong somewhere, you can walk in there. <laughs> Don't even need to knock. It's my house. <laughs> it's my house. I remember years ago uh, when I was in the military reserves and I was in college and I was just a little PFC working as a clerk typist and, and we were having exercises up at Camp Drum. I get, had to deliver a message. So I'm off in the woods carrying this message from the, from the general tent where I worked off to some colonel somewhere and coming back I cross a road where there are some guards and they step out and they give me the password I didn't know what the password was I had missed it they might have said hot dog and I said hamburger and it wasn't that it was supposed to be bun I don't know what it was they jumped out and said something and the minute they said it I said you know what I didn't pick up the password this morning now I was from another outfit than all of theirs. So my patches on my uniform didn't look like anything. So these guys assume I must be, you know, trying to hide behind their lines, sneak. I'm part of something. And I said, I work in the general's tent. I'm his clerk typist. And so they decided to take me to the general's tent. <clears throat> and they're marching me down. Here we go. And I'm walking between the two of them. And there's a general's tent about as far away as that other wall is. And I start walking down the pathway to it. And they said, where are you going? I said, it's a general's tent. He's in there. Can you see him? I work for him. 
One says to the other, I'm not going in where the general is. The other one says, neither am I. And they let me go in. The question is, why did I just walk boldly? I belong there. I was sealed. I was marked. I might only be a PFC. And there's colonels and majors and generals in there. I might only be a PFC, but you see that desk over there with that typewriter? That's my typewriter. That's my desk. I have all the authority to walk in there. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Had total confidence because I knew who I was. You need to know who you are in spiritual things. The devil knows. Come on, he knows that. Remember when those seven sons of Sceva, they went to a, a, a Bible study one night and they found out there was a formula for casting out demons at that Bible study. They decided they'd go try it. They found themselves a demon-possessed man and said, in the name of Yeshua, whom Paul preaches. Why were they right? Is the formula in the name of Yeshua? Yes. Is, is that the one whom Paul preaches? Yes. Their theology was correct, but the relationship was absent. That's a sure way to get yourself killed. See, they had correct theology, but they had no mark on them. And the demons knew that, and they said this, Paul we know, Yeshua we know, who are you? And the demon tore them apart. All seven of them got torn apart by a demon. Because he said, Paul I know, Yeshua I know, who are you? They had no mark on them. They were not marked by the blood of the Lamb. They were not sealed by the Holy Spirit. Oh, they might have had great confidence in what they were saying, great knowledge. They could parse the Greek of casting out demons. But they had no relationship. They were not marked by the Lamb. When you're marked by the Lamb, you have no fear. When you're marked by the Lamb, you can do great things for God. Can you say amen? You see, we talk about the events that unfold in these end times and why I think it's a message for it. I don't plan to be there during all this seven trumpets, seven seals, and seven bowls. I don't plan to be there. But I've got this to say, that I don't know how much of pre-tribulation birth pangs are going to hit this planet while we are still here. And we better be prepared to know how are we going to walk through it. Is this, just, is this just preaching? Is this just Bible? Or does this really make a difference that we have a seal upon us. Has God really sealed you and marked you with an identifier that you are His? Amen. And when the devil touches your life, he has trespassed on God's property. Right. Now, if you're inviting him in, shame on you. The devil cannot just come in your life unless you open the door to him, unless you say come in, unless you're in rebellion, unless you're in a place where he can come in. He can't just walk in there because you've got a seal on you. That's who you are. David Wilkerson sitting in his, I think, an Assembly of God church in Pennsylvania years and years ago reading about the, the, the drug kids in New York City felt God's Holy Spirit touch his life and say, you go preach to those boys. He knew nothing about the inner city. He knew nothing about drugs. He knew nothing about that. But he was obedient. And he went into, into New York City. You can read it. The book is The Cross and the Switchblade. And there he started interacting with these, with these boys. One of them said, preacher, I'm going to cut you up. And he said, if you do it, he says, I'm going to love you with every piece you cut. Absolutely amazing. Began to win them to Christ. Why? He knew who he was. He knew who he was. There was another black preacher working in New York City years ago who, who some guys came after him and they were going to kill him, they said. And he began to run. And he ran and ran until he was all out of breath. They're chasing him down the street. He gets up on a porch and, and, they, and he turns around and now they're just sitting there smugly looking at him with their knives out. And something rises up in him. And he looks at him and says, you will not touch a man of God. And this look of fear came over their faces and they ran. This preacher said, why didn't I think of that first? Why, why didn't I say that first? That's who you are. Terry Mize looks in the eyes of that, that guy in Mexico who's got a gun pointed right at, it, right at him. Six feet away from him, I'm going to shoot you. Terry Mize says, you can't kill me. I'm marked. I'm protected by the blood of the Lamb. And the guy unloaded his pistol and all the bullets hit the ground right in front of Terry. 
The guy just absolutely fell to the ground, panic stricken. Terry led him to the Lord. See, this is a God I serve, Terry said, a God who your bullets can't stop. Well, well what if I tried that and it didn't work? Well, if you're going to try it, it probably won't work. But nevertheless, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I win in the end either way. Amen. But see, Terry Mize knew who he was. He knew there was a mark on his life, a seal on his life. Glory to God. We haven't talked enough about God's protection, about God's seal. Look with me to the book of Jude. You'll find that right before Revelation. All 25 verses of Jude. Right before Revelation chapter 1. Notice what Jude says at the end. Verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forever and ever. He is able to keep you from falling and to present you without fault. I'm not trusting in myself to do that. I'm trusting in my God to do that. God is able to keep you. God is able to protect you. God is able to, to why, why can he do that? Because he sealed you as his own. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you don't need to turn there, verses 7 through 9. You do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Yeshua to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying to the Corinthians just what Jude said. The God who called you is able to keep you. The God who called you into the family surely will not lose you. He's able to keep you. He marked you as His. I don't find anywhere in the Bible where He's going to take the mark off of you. Bam, you're mine. You're marked. You're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. Go get them. Glory to God. 2 Timothy, last verse I want to look at today. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says this. Powerful statement. And you need to make this statement your own. In fact, turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This ought to be underlined in your Bible. Write it on a card. Put it on your doorpost. If you can come to the point where you are in total agreement, you can say what Paul said here. Boy, you're, you're on your way to victory. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I know whom I have believed. I know. One of the translations says, I know in whom I've believed. I know him the same way that a man knows a woman and they conceive a child. Not I've heard about him. Not I have an idea about him. Not I've been educated about him. But I know him. I know whom I have believed. And am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. What day? That day that's out there. That day of judgment, that day when all hell breaks loose, that day that stands out in front when the wrath of God is revealed, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded, I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. That's King James because that's how I memorized it when I was 16. <laughs> I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. The Message Bible says, I couldn't be more sure of my ground. The one I've trusted in can take care of what he's trusted me to do right to the end. As a young child, young, young boy growing up in church, all I heard was that I have to give my life to Jesus. I have to give my life to Jesus. I have to give my life to Jesus. I never really heard the message that Jesus gave his life to me. I'm sure it was preached in there somewhere, but it was all about what can I give him? What can I give him? What do I need to give him? I surrender all. Wait a minute, he gave me his all. You know, when I, I surrender all, I'm always finding more I got to give, more I got to give, more I got to give. 
But when I turn it around, he gave his all to you. He gave everything for you. And then he sealed you with his, he didn't say, look, I'm glad you want to be part of my family. I've got a trial period. And, and you're welcome to come into the family and live here for seven years or so. And then we're going to come in and we're going to have that day when we sit down and say, well, you know, you're just not doing too hot. You know? No, as, as one of my early mentors in ministry said, Chris Lyons always said, God bought the package deal. He bought you and all your warts, all your mistakes, all your failures, all your stinking attitudes. He bought the whole package deal and said, I want to buy you. I'll take you just as you are. By the way, I'm not going to leave you as you are, but I'm going to take you as you are. Don't try to get reformed and come to God. It isn't going to work. You come to God and let Him who bought you now change you. Glory to God. You know, we bought a house this summer. Can you imagine how silly it would be if, uh, if the people we're going to buy it from said, look, we're going to fix it up for you. We're going to wallpaper it for you. We're going to do all this stuff. Wait a minute. I don't want you putting your idea of good wallpaper in there. I, I don't want you to say, well, we're going to paint it all. No, no, no. I don't want you painting your colors, in fact, I saw the colors you painted it in. <clears throat> Amen. You know, uh, we're going to do, no, no, no. I'm buying the house as it is. I'm very aware of the house as it is, and I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to repaint it. We're going we're gonna to put wall borders on it. We're going to put, you know, uh, oak staircase going up front instead of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. We're going to do this. I mean, I, we bought it as is with a picture in our mind of what he, we wanted it to be. I didn't say to the, uh, the owners, if you'll make it like I want it, then I'll buy it. They'd say, forget it. We'll find another buyer. God bought the package deal. And when he bought you, he stamped you. He sealed you with his mark. You are a marked person. Come on. The devil knows whether you're for real or not. He's got a case book on you. Watch that one. Let's see if we can double team that one. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Sunday football. What do you think they do? Well, we got to watch that tight end there. We're going to have to put two on him. We got to really, how are we going to deal with that right tackle over there? Come on, you're dealing with the team. Right? You're assigning your people to make sure. Well, the devil sees, who are we playing this week? Oh, you're playing Donna Long. Oh, no, not again. All right, come on, let's call up the reserves. I want my, my biggest tackles. <laughs> I want my biggest this. I want this. I want this. Come on. Boss, it's Monday morning. Okay, who do you got to deal with today? Well, I got to deal with the people from Faith Christian Church. Ah, yes, yes. oh, man, well, I'll tell you, just, they're, they're, Get out there. Come on. You've got to disrupt those people because, you know, they're coming into a sense of unity. And when they know they're one, they cannot be defeated. So don't ever let them know they're one. Irritate them with one another. Stir them up. Do whatever you can do. Don't let them find out they're one. <laughs> Come on. They know us. They know you. Why? You're marked. You're marked. You're marked. Come on. The keeping power of God. In the midst of seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, judgment like the world can't see, God releases and anoints and appoints 144,000 young men and seals them so they can walk through that untouched. Do you think God is, do, is going to do less for you? His goal is that you are sealed with a divine protection to walk through these events without even, without even a, breaking out into a sweat. Doesn't matter what happens. I don't get stirred up. I'm not, I'm not going to get bent out of shape. I'm not going to get into fear. Oh, what are we going to do? No. Though the earth shake, the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea, I will not fear. For the Lord is with me. He is my shield and defense. Come on. Come on. 
See, if, if we can look into the events of the tribulation and say, well, look what God did there, don't you think he's going to do the same for you? He's been trying to tell you, you're sealed, you're set apart, you're marked. But now let me end with this. Those 144, were they marked so they could just walk through life saying, ha, 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 Antichrist can't touch me, Antichrist can't touch me, ha, 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 ha. No. They were marked so they could go out and preach the word to a world that was facing judgment. We've got to get out of our selfishness. It's not, oh, I'm protected. No, I'm protected so I have something to say. We're to walk sealed so that we can impact the lives of other people. This is not time to be buddy-buddy and pat them on the back to tell them their judgment is coming. This nation, this world, this earth is going to go through things as the consequences of decision. Do you think the consequences of this election are not already taking place? Do you think that a nation standing up and saying, we don't want you, God. Do you think nation, there's not national judgment coming? But we can be the voice that calls people under the right side of judgment. Judgment's coming, but you can be on the right side. You can be safe. You can be secure. You can be marked like I am. You can come into relationship with God and say, God, I repent for being foolish, for being so self-centered for thinking I'm the God of my own life. I, 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 I come to you and ask you to forgive me and I'm going to do it your way. And I'll receive your answer. But how are they going to do that unless they hear? And how are they going to hear unless someone tells them? You're marked and sealed because there's people out there who need to hear. Because without your voice, where are they going to go? If you don't tell them, who will? And if you don't tell them now, when will you tell them?